So here are some things as we talk about uh, explanations and the why question. Uh, do, do you recall just why was Governor Gray Davis recalled? Energy deregulation, and do you know when the governor after him left office, who, who was less popular? The governor who replaced Gray Davis or Gray Davis in terms of polls? Yeah, it's, it's fascinating. The replacement governor ended up being less popular, uh, at least in the polls that, that I recall. Uh, here, here's another why question. Why has the Yucca Mountain nuclear waste site not been commissioned? Is that a technical issue or is that a behavioral? Behavioral. Uh, behavioral. Has anyone here been out there to, to Yucca Mountain? It's, it's worth it. I, I know that nobody here ever goes to Vegas, but if you ever found yourself <laughs> in, in Vegas, uh, at least a few years ago, you could arrange for a free tour of the Yucca Mountain facility and, in fact, Lunch is even provided. It's interesting. This is your tax dollars at, at work. And uh, I would encourage you just to Google Yucca Mountain, and they'll pick you up at your hotel, and, and they take you out to the site, uh, which is about an hour away or so, as I recall. And there's, there's some other, uh, other issues. Um, we have this third one, you, um, and we may have presented this at, at a previous conference, but um, here's some other kinds of things. We had an, in uh, Ontario, we had an ethylene oxide explosion, and um, when you get this copy of the slides, when you, you can, the Chemical Safety Board did a minor, they didn't do a full blown explanation, but uh, investigation, but they did do enough to do a really cool video, one of those little animated videos of what happened and why it blew up. And there is a technical part of the explanation as to what happened with the ethylene oxide and why it exploded. But just from your experience with, um, this is a CalARP facility, ethylene oxide, um, for those who aren't familiar with the chemical, is one that has a very wide um, uh, explosive range as well as being a carcinogen and highly toxic. So um, uh, uh, would you imagine with a CalARP facility that had an explosion that it's all technical issues? Right, there's going to be a combination of technical issues and behavioral issues when you have um, an accident. Um, why are specific inspectors reluctant to pursue formal enforcement action against specific recalcitrant violators? What kind of issue is that? It's probably a behavioral issue, and if there are technical issues to resolve, like your forms are too complicated or whatever it is, you know, there might be procedural issues you can work on. But when you get to those problems, when you're addressing them, whatever level you're involved with them, it's helpful to break them down and say, well, we've got this part of it is a behavioral issue, and this part of it, there may be something that can be broken out, and maybe that part of the project can be defined as technical, and the technical work can be assigned to someone technical, and this other part we need to work on as a behavioral issue. Um, why did or will specific violators not do very basic, specific, documented actions to return to compliance? Most likely a behavioral, an adaptive issue where you're ha having to work on motivation um, and learning and framing and other things that will change, um, uh, uh, hopefully, somehow adjust their reality. Okay, thanks, Marilyn. And I think this was uh, in terms of arguments. Uh, oh, yes, I'm sorry, that's me too. Um, the, we've got some examples here of an argument and an explanation, um, just to uh, uh, another in the Koopa side. When we give a, a reason for doing something, we're presenting an argument for it. So, for example, if we take formal enforcement action against WM company, where the argument is that this in action is appropriate because there's a pattern of recalcitrance, and then we provide the evidence. Um, the company has been given due process notice and opportunity to comply and has failed to return to compliance, and then we have that information. And then the company handles a regulated substance of this kind, which on such and such a date was released but not reported by the facility, combined with multiple business plan and CalArp violation, this situation has a high potential for harm to the public, their employees, and response personnel. That's an argument that is the reason for taking the action. Now, when we explain, we are citing an individual's reason for doing something. We're explaining why he or she did it. So, Inspector Jones filed a formal enforcement action against WM Company because uh, 
the company had not returned to compliance after other informal process failed. It doesn't mean that, you know, that that's, can be one explanation. Uh, there are other explanations too, right? That is, Inspector Jones has performance goals of Inspector Jones's own, and he's trying to meet those performance goals, and Inspector Jones wants to promote. There might be a whole number of reasons of explanations as to why Inspector Jones filed the enforcement case. These are the positive ones. We won't talk about the um, WM company pissed off Inspector Jones because you know that one shouldn't be there. Um, but you certainly have to look at explanations um, and arguments as different types of things. Uh, but those would be st standard um, explanations for an individual's behavior versus the argument for why the formal enforcement action um, is um, appropriate. But for, for you folks working in Coupa, do you have to explain stuff or is it just simply the argument that is the most important uh, part in your day-to-day -day work? Is it mostly just the facts, ma'am, or the facts, or, or is there some interpretation or explanation that normally goes along with that? I think it's always. Thank you. Just because there's a, there there needs to be explanation so people see why they have to do it, they you you can just tell them they've got to do it. But if you don't explain why, they they, they don't see any value. If there's no value for them, they won't do it. Okay. And it could be a negative value, but right. Okay. Uh, thanks, guys. Explanations are relative, and this is important to, to keep in mind. A good explanation for you is not necessarily a good explanation for everybody else. Um, what you could get by your professor at one university, you may not be able to get by in another class in a different university. And let me give you an illustration. Uh, this example is you find a puddle under your toilet, and that might be explained by a leaking wax seal. Now, if you own the house, you might want to know why, right? For all you homeowners, I can't tell you how much of my life has been spent at Home Depot and, and Lowe's. It's a, a disproportionate amount of my adulthood has been spent there, uh, typically going back a second and third time to fix something that I broke when I was trying to fix it uh, during an earlier iteration. If you're renting a house, you may just want to call the landlord, who gives a rat's behind why, right? It's just water under, under the toilet. And uh, so the explanatory adequacy is relative to one's needs. It can't be ambiguous, it can't be vague, and it can't be incompatible with established fact. So as you're engaged in a thought process and, in, and working with your, your clients, customers, and coworkers, uh, this is something uh, that you would want to uh, reflect on uh, just, just a little bit. And now, can we think of examples where an explanation is needed in hazardous materials management? Okay, so um, when we're talking about different audiences is the way that I think of it, but for, how does SIRS work? Well, it kind of depends on who you're talking about. This is that landlord versus not landlord kind of thing. So if you're a small business and you're trying to explain how does SIRS work, you might be starting with the, you need to have an email address, access to a computer, and a paper version of your forms, right? That's kind of the beginning version of how does SIRS work? You're gonna have to start with, a, you gotta do that and then you're gonna get online. So the way that you start that conversation and what you're talking about is basically getting to what the minimum they need to know to get on there to get started. You do not wanna be getting into um, stuff about electronic data transfer, right? You may, those words may never come out of your mouth, right? If you're talking to a multi-jurisdictional um, business, you're gonna be talking to them about Cal EPA. Um, and you're gonna be talking to them about setting up an organization, and you're gonna be talking to them about electronic data transfer. Words that may never even come out of your mouth when you're talking to a small business. Um, emergency responders, if that's the audience that you're talking to, you're you may be talking about um, work that you're gonna do as a unified program agency uh, 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 that might enhance what's being done by SERS. Maybe you've got something you're adding on. Uh, you might talk about the online interface that's in the works and uh, being improved. Um, and, uh, but, and you might be talking about, well, it's not gonna be what we were doing. 
It's not going to be the paper anymore. But the, but the point is, it's going to be different conversations with different explanations um, based on the, the, the relevance, the adequacy of the explanation. And the responders aren't going to want to hear what you needed to tell the small business. And the small businesses aren't going to want to hear what you needed to tell the responders. Um, which means that there is no one size fits all on our outreach for SIRS. Um, it's uh, customized, uh, needs to be customized. Same thing, another, option, uh, another example here. What are my options for managing used oil? Uh, how, many, how many times do you actually tell the full truth to a regulated business? The absolute truth about every option that is in Title 22 about management of used oil. Well, there are a lot of different ways you can manage used oil, but the chances are that if it doesn't seem like it's relevant to them, you're not going to bring up remote consolidation, limited self-transportation, or some other things that are more likely to get them into trouble when you bring them up as topics than they are to solve their problem. You're, gonna, you're going to pay attention to what they're doing on their site, um, help them manage that, and bring up solutions that are relevant to the problems you see at their site. That's part of that explanatory adequacy. It's adequate for that situation and the situations they're talking to you about, but it isn't everything. It is not everything on the topic. It is based on where they're at what, and their frame of reference, where, what they need to hear. Thanks. Okay, so kind of wrapping this up with the adequacy, it depends on the level of granularity needed by the customer. Uh, is it testable? Is the water under the toilet cold? If it is, then maybe it's, it's coming from a certain part of the system versus hot water, uh, which may be coming from somewhere else. Uh, we need to be consistent, not be in conflict with fact or theory. There shouldn't be a circular argument. I think most of you are familiar with those. And avoid unnecessary assumptions or unnecessary complexities would simply uh, muddle uh, the, the issue. Finally, and we're, we're getting into uh, the end game here with, with critical thinking and, and our, our morning presentation, the whole idea of, of forming hypotheses. Within the critical thinking literature, this is referred to as inference to the best explanation. That's a little slightly different definition than what you're familiar with. And there's different ways of thinking about that. The first one is called the method of difference. What is different about today or the situation under consideration uh, that is different from, from other days. Why did my student not, who's always very reliable, not submit their paper uh, t today? Uh, why are conditions, are there conditions that, that are different uh, today than from other days? There's also method of agreement, uh, which is, involves covariates. The issue under consideration is associated with, with some other condition. Can, can you think of any examples of that, where there's covariates? Sam, maybe we'll, we'll put you on the spot if you can think of any that, uh, that might immediately come to mind. Yes. Uh, I can give you a scenario that I'm working on right now. Uh, as we're trying to ascertain whether residential proximity to a busy freight rate yard is causing adverse health effects in the pop surrounding populations. So we, we have to look at co-variation with other things, uh, like traffic going by other sources, uh, in essence. So we do this type of exercise often. Uh, right. When and, and, and for those of you that have taken an epidemiology class, sometimes uh, they, these are referred to as confounders, right? You, you think that one thing is causing another, but there may be some other explanation uh, that's, that's also available. And then within the literature, there's something called post hoc fallacy. Uh, that is, one thing is caused by another because it happened before the outcome under question. Uh, for example, my colleagues, who I like very much, seem to believe that taking zinc tablets will put them at less risk of catching a cold or getting the flu. And you guys have heard this, right? And, okay, I, and uh, so when someone doesn't get a cold, they say it's because of the zinc tablet uh, that they took. Well, uh, what was the thing that happened first? They took the zinc tablet. What happened after that? They didn't get a cold, so that they equate the two. And we all know that that's probably untrue. 
uh, and I'll take on my zinc colleagues at some later date, but uh, this is, uh, the, this is uh, the post hoc uh, fallacy. So what are some of the, these confounders in logic as we think about uh, the kind of work that we do? Uh, number one, it, that the connection between A and B is uh, coincidental. Um, uh, can you give me an example of something with simply a, a, a coincidence? Someone may say, oh, yes, uh, and, and in the absence of any energetic person from the audience, I, I could also just say that the zinc tablet in catching a cold, is, a, is a, it's just a coincidence that the person was taking zinc, right? But are there not folks that will jump to that logic and say, oh, it's because I took the zinc tablet, okay? Have you so, had, let me ask you, have you had, what about neighbor complaints? Come on, neighbor complaints about hazardous materials facilities. What are some of the claims that you've had that have resulted in you going out on an inspection because a neighbor says that when the facility did blank, my cat died? Or when the, whenever this happens, my whatever. Now, I'm not saying they're always coincidences, but sometimes it's kind of, well, yes, the cat was 18 years old and, and, the, you know, and the cat did die and the facility is there. I have one example of that. So. <laughs> on those lines. I think about, it's on. I think uh, it's on. Bus Depot facility uh, near our campus. Uh, people have collected birds uh, dropping uh, you know, off the sky. So, you know, because uh, th this operation is going on and the buses were refueling, you know, uh, birds drop off the sky. And, make, you know, this operation is making the birds uh, sick and so on, literally, and some neighbors collected dead some birds. birds. Right now, that, that could be a number of things, right? Because what was the other thing that, at least in our area, I know we had another thing that was calling, causing birds to fall out of the sky. We really did, right? Is it West Nile? Yeah, we had West Nile. So, so that could either be a, um, a, a confounder in the sense of covariate, or it could be a coincidence that birds are just, you know, have expired. Okay, a, a second confounder, and I had a little bit of fun with this. I hope that's okay. A and B, activity A and activity B, result from a third thing. And uh, let's say that you forgot to brush your teeth last night and you woke up with a headache this morning. Um, it was actually caused by a third thing, and, and that was the margaritas that you, were, that you were drinking last night, right? So you may want to tie A and B together, but they were really caused by alcohol consumption upstairs at the, at the lounge, right? So there, there's an illustration, and I, I'm assuming then you're beginning to see the pattern here. And the third one is B caused A rather than the other way around. What's fascinating to, to me is just this whole logic of, or what I've heard is logic is, Oh, if you have a positive attitude, your health will be better. Have you heard that? And, right? Be positive. Or is it because you have good health that you feel good and therefore you have a positive attitude? Which, which, which came first? So in any case, that's something else. If you haven't had enough to think about this morning, this is something else to, to ponder. So when you get these explanations, uh, that are presented to you, you really need to think them through. And history is replete uh, with illustrations where that, uh, that, that didn't occur. And then here, I, I'm afraid I've, I've burned the zinc example into the ground. Don't fall into the proof by disproof or something appeal to anecdotes. How many anecdotes or stories have you heard? Well, my granddad did it this way and it worked perfectly <laughs> fine. Are, do any of those exist in the Koopa world? Like oh, or, or urban legends uh, about. And anybody who knows me knows that this is true. I never catch the flu because I make everybody else around me get inoculated. <laughs> <laughs> well, and then okay, there's the, the that one worries me a little bit. <laughs> well, and then there's the um, I've. Um, I've, I've, been, I've been putting my hands in this stuff for 35 years, uh, old solvent dude, you know, the, oh, right. oh, the plater guy that, you know, has been swimming in this stuff for 30 years and, you know, and he doesn't realize what he looks like. <laughs> All right. Okay, and uh, 
as we push off towards close, there's the writing argument essays. The one number one thing I see that is poor among graduates of the public health enterprise is our inability to teach young people how to write well. Do, do, you, do you share these? Maybe you're guilty of, of, of some of this uh, your, yourself. Uh, as we write uh, what we're thinking uh, in our logic and our arguments, um, we want to be sure that we have a statement of the issue. I cannot get my daughter to do this, by the way. She doesn't know what the meaning of a topic sentence. A statement of your position on that issue, arguments that support your position, and rebuttal of arguments that are contrary uh, to the position in that particular order. For rebuttals, for those of you that may get caught in a crossfire, confine your statements to your opponent's views. It is not helpful for you when you make personal comments about somebody who may disagree with your interpretation of data. Do not call opposing arguments absurd. Remember the whole framing thing we talked about this morning. If you start to do that, you lose some of your credibility. Where an element of an opposing view is good, you should call it out. When you are conducting inspections and your, your customer is doing something good, be sure to point that out. Concentrate on your most important considerations in a written document first, right? And so put those up front. In my personal opinion, if you're writing memos or some other uh, uh, piece of information that you hope will influence someone, if it's more than one page, you are wasting your time. Most people, most busy professionals, will simply only read uh, the, the first side of the first sheet of paper. And, and if you want to have another conversation about this, I, I would be uh, delighted to, to do that. Things to avoid in the written word, cliches, including contemporary ones, generalizations, exaggerations. For those of you, you guys know what a passive writing style is versus active writing style? Okay, we always want to encourage people to use an active writing style. A lack of specificity or things to avoid, verb noun disagreement, and parenthetical remarks. You don't need those parentheses there. Now let me also say something about cliche. Is, are there Koopa cliches? That there is a vernacular that only you guys know? Right, yeah, okay, so l let me give you an illustration. If I hear the word robust one more time this year, I'm gonna blow up, right? People use it. All, in all the different public health professions. And it's like, where was this word outside of statistics, right? Uh, some 10 years ago, it, it was never, never used. Uh, I, was, I was in fact given a deck of cards which describes some of these, and some of these come to, uh, may come to mind. There's come to Jesus, buy-in, big ask, work-life balance, bandwidth, outsource, out-of-pocket, core, core competency. Oh my gosh, brain dump, results driven, reverbiage, uh, outside the box, open the, com open the kimono. You ever heard of that? On the same page. All right, so we, we want to avoid uh, some of that stuff whenever we're, we're writing. Okay, and, and how to improve our writing style, Marilyn? Um, these are just a, a couple to keep in, keep in mind. So maybe you'll think of something just real quick. Okay, how could you improve conducted review of training records on site? What's the problem? Just point out the problem there. What's on site? The training record or the what you conducted? Did you conduct it on site or were the training records on site? So it's ambiguous, right? So the way we might improve that would be to talk about what records we actually reviewed, be more specific, and make sure that whatever you're referring to, you can tell what your adverbs and adjectives are actually referring to. Poor housekeeping more specifics about what did you actually see? Your observations should be able to tell whether that was something was in the aisleway or was there spillage on the ground or you know what did you actually observe? Because poor housekeeping is what? It's a judgment. It's not really an observation. No labels on drums. It's most likely an exaggeration um, for one thing. There might not have been a hazardous waste label on a hazardous waste drum, but chances are there was some form of label on some drum somewhere, and if someone can point out that that is not a true statement, you call into question your credibility on your other statements. Because if there was even a NFPA label or a hazard communication label or some other kind of label on a drum, then no labels on drums is not a true statement. It's an exaggeration. 
and so it would need to be um, more accurate. Inadequate funding and staff. Does anybody find that to be humorous at all? Inad What's inadequate? Inadequate staff? Yeah. Well, I, our staff has never been inadequate. We have sometimes had an inadequate level of staffing. But m I'll tell you right now, my staff, staff is not inadequate. Um, is that we need to be careful about the way that we word things. Um, uh, and uh, uh, to make it very specific what you're saying and read it in very many different ways. And around our place, we make sure we pass it by some other people. Because remember, your frame is not the same as another frame, which means if you pass it by somebody who is different than you, figure out the people around you who are different than you and make sure you use them to check yourself. Okay, finally, as we wrap up, uh, we want to talk about sources of credibility as we think about uh, critical thinking. Uh, these are some of the uh, traditional ones. If someone is well-educated, has relevant experience, relevant accomplishments, uh, their reputation is good, uh, they're in honor to. The, in our line of work, that they are objective, lack bias, or whatever bias they have is visible, that they're transparent in terms of whatever their financial interest is in a company, and this last one, that whatever evidence they're presenting is specific to the site that you're looking at. Um, is very important. Um, that is, they're not just boilerplating. Um, very, um, very qualified people with lots of letters behind their names, like these very qualified gentlemen we have here, are would be um, uh, can look very impressive and, in fact, intimidating to people that maybe we don't have as many letters behind our names. And um, and but if their information is not specific to this site, then we've got every reason to question it. Are you saying I'm not credible? If your evidence is specific to this site, <laughs> I'd have you on any case I had. Absolutely. All right. Um, this um, uh, experience and site-specific evidence, um, uh, never um, uh, disregard your own common sense and the obvious. Uh, don't ignore the obvious. Don't stop at the obvious. Dig deeper. Um, don't underestimate the ability of intelligent and ed educated people to ignore the obvious and to stop at the obvious. Uh, uh, so trust your professional um, and ever-expanding professional judgment and ask questions until you're satisfied as a professional. Marilyn, can you give an example of where a well-educated, respected person completely missed? Yes, um, and this, this one kind of as an illustration of this is that we had um, one facility, it is the place that blew up, um, uh, Sterogenics. Uh, and, um, and they had a, a number of very qualified people that had worked on their risk management plans. And uh, they had done uh, more than 20, it was between 20 and 30 risk management plans in the country. They all looked very good on paper. Um, uh, but when we got out to the site to actually do the um, uh, verifications, uh, they had indicated for the offsite consequence analysis that the, um, uh, that the ethylene oxide was stored in a building, and that affects uh, the offsite consequence analysis results. And there was a chain link fence, which ethylene oxide doesn't exactly stop at the chain link fence and go, oh, there, <laughs> that's where I stop right now. And um, lots of credentials behind people. Uh, uh, everybody was qualified in the professional sense, uh, but what they had done is they had um, boilerplated one operation, and they, and they had to, to, I think it was 26 other uh, facilities that they had to refile on because we were the only ones who had walked on site that had, at, at, up until that day, and nationwide, they had to redo their other, um, their other facilities, um, RMPs, because we had walked on site and said, that's not true, and they evidently had one facility that was representative of what they had filed, but hadn't, um, uh, hadn't field checked. So and what I'm saying is that people, when they're you know, busy and they're trying to file their compliance paperwork, sometimes can think that everybody else has checked the obvious. Part of our job is to make sure and to verify that um, you're a big part of that, and that can be a real benefit to public safety um, and the environment and health, that you pay attention to those observations and hold other people accountable um, for what you see and be asked until you're satisfied. Did you have a question or comment? Yeah. Well, the only thing that my question was, that how many times have you seen that actually take place in terms of the RMP being more than what in that in that type of situation where you came on site and checked against it? What was 
some of the responses that you gave me, but that's the behavioral aspect of it. That is a behavioral aspect. It has to do with how much people assign off responsibility to consultants rather than take responsibility themselves. Um, there's also, and so unfortunately, I'd say that it's one of the reasons why, and I'll, I'll move past the RMP to the business plan program, why our program decided that we could, and it feeds into our SERS issues, is that we decided we could not accept um, uh, or verify business plans in the office, that we would only um, deem a, a business plan compliant in the field because the difference between what someone would say was at their facility and what was at their facility um, was uh, too disparate. And we had previously had a practice of saying, hey, the paper looks good. We'll issue an acceptance letter to the facility that uh, as a piece of paper, you know, it met all the paper requirements. And we stopped doing that practice um, many, many years ago because of differences between field observation and, um, and what was on the paper. And I'm not saying anybody did that intentionally at all. I'm saying that there's a difference in your level of education and theirs, and that's part of what you're out there to do. Um, okay. It, it, something that we want to avoid is to be taken in by euphemisms uh, in the way information is presented to us. Uh, these are two that are probably familiar to you. When someone says they have a pre-owned car, let's face it, they have a used car, right? And But there's very clever marketing around that. And then another euphemism would be freedom fighter. In somebody else's frame, that's a terrorist, right? And so we, we, we need to think carefully with the way that information is presented to us and the way that we, we convey that uh, back out to the public. And then finally, we're, we're wrapping up our four hours together th this morning. And we started by looking at, at this photo. And we would hope through the material that you've been exposed to this morning that, that perhaps uh, you, you see both the albatross and the bunny. Did we say duck? Right? <laughs> okay. To me, I'm, I'm seeing an albatross here uh, uh, right away. But uh, we would hope that this literally gives you something to think about. And as you move forward in time and space to think about those frames and to think critically about the work that you do um, every day to bring that passion uh, and your, your critical thinking processes to even the most mundane kinds of activities, it really strikes close to home the last illustration that Marilyn gave in as much that we see a lot of boilerplating, which makes no sense. And if you're not awake and looking for it, uh, don't don't let that happen to you. Don't boilerplate uh, yeah, yourself. So as we wrap up here, I'd like to, to thank you, Marilyn and I both, and, and Dr. Sarep. You. Uh, we'd like to, to thank you for your attendance here this morning. We talked really about two major issues. One was framing and the way that we think about uh, information that's conveyed to us. And the second part to that within the context of a frame was critical thinking. That is, what are the inductive and deductive methods that we use to come to conclusions about information that we're either A, collecting ourselves, or B, uh, that we are interpreting for, for others. And having said that, I would like to recognize the California Nevada Training Center who made this program possible today and for some of the thoughtful work that came out of a university, I think it's Cal State Chico, uh, a book called Critical Thinking uh, by Brooke Moore and Richard Parker. And with that, I would like to see if there's any final questions, comments, or criticisms. You guys are ready for lunch? Okay, I certainly hope this hasn't been too academic this morning, and uh, thanks for your attendance.